dedicated to empowering you with information to make positive choices and be advocates for your overall well-being. Welcome to The Health View. Welcome to The Health View. I'm Yvonne Dunitz. And today my guest is Dr. Benjamin Garber, who has focused all of his years in his practice on child and family development. And he is also an author of six books. And one of them, which is the title and the topic of our subject today, is about letting go, holding tight, and letting go. And as we prepare and get ready to move forward to a new school year, it's a perfect topic. Welcome to our show. I'm so delighted that you're here today. Thank you very much, Yvonne. And thank you for all the work that you do, because you write a column every week. Every second week, twice every a month. Every second week. And that's in the Nashua Telegraph, is it? It appears in the Sunday Telegraph, and it's syndicated elsewhere around the world. And that topic and your approach to that is to let people know about what? Generally, as a psychologist, what I try to do is help parents raise healthy children. Which is wonderful. And so the topics are everything from anything and everything dealing with healthy children. So that topic of holding tight and letting go, I know that there is a very important story that is connected with that. Let's jump right into that. Well, it's, it's more of a metaphor that explains what we're talking about, Yvonne. Uh, most of us as parents who have children more than six or seven years old have had the experience of putting the child on the two-wheeler with the training wheels on, but the child has seen his or her peers running down the street, riding down the street without training wheels. There's a pressure to, to work towards independence as we grow. So the story goes like this. Uh, you put little Sally or Billy on the, on the bike, and he or she complains, take off the training wheels, and eventually you do, you must. You don't want to keep the child riding on training wheels forever. It might be safer that way, but the child would never learn independence. So you take off the training wheels and you put one hand on the seat and one hand on the, on the handlebars, and the child is wearing her helmet and she's all excited and, and it's a gorgeous autumn day and the leaves are crunching underneath her feet or your feet, and she's riding and you're running and you're out of breath. And there comes that moment in the midst of learning to ride a two-wheeler, like in the midst of learning to walk and, and walking down the aisle and going to college and going back to school in the fall, there's inevitably that moment where parents have to decide, am I going to let the child go? Okay. There's a risk involved because the child on the two-wheeler for the first time is going to fall down and skin her knees. Okay. She's going to rip a hole in her jeans. She's going to cry and scratch her palms. And you could prevent that, but in doing so, you'd be inhibiting her opportunity for independence and autonomy. So you eventually let go. Maybe it's because you're out of breath, you can't keep up with the bike, and maybe she does fine for another 10 or 20 feet or several yards or down the block, but then she crashes. And then you're there, and you reassure her, and you pick her up, and you dust her off. And even though you're scared, and even though you know she's going to get hurt again, you encourage her to try again. So how we respond and not react to that particular fall sets the tone of how we're going to respond, support, and a variety of different things that may go when we have to let go. That statement is, is more true than perhaps even you know. I, I want to highlight that we live in a very scary world. That when you and I were children, at least when I was a child long ago, we had less to fear perhaps. These days, when we let our children go, we let them go into a world that's full of terrorism and toxins and, and technology that, that really are very real threats to our kids. So we let go, biting our tongue, crossing our fingers, and taking every realistic precaution we can. But ultimately, we must let go. It's because as parents, a lot of us would like to take the hit for our child. In other words, if we have to suffer or if we have to have the pain, and the hurt, we'd rather we have it than they go through it. Well, well let me part of the process is to allow them to go through it, to know that they can move forward and grow. And on that subject, let me, let me share with you something that I often say in my office, and, and I often share with people when I have the opportunity to speak to groups. And people sometimes object or complain or, or resist. 
But I firmly believe that our job as parents is to help our children be healthy, not happy. So you let go and they fall down and they skin their knees or they get frustrated or they can't stay up all night or they can't have a fifth helping of dessert and they must go back to school even though summer is just a joyous period of sleeping in and indulging your, your whims and your, and, your, and your wishes. And the job we have as parents is to help our kids learn how to manage that frustration, how to manage their pain. Because if they get to be adults and they have no experience, no skills, no, no tools with which to manage their pain, they won't succeed. And we need to give them those tools. That's correct. So as we embark on a new school year, what do we need to do to help prepare children at different stages of entry into the school system? It's a huge question, and I'm glad to have the opportunity to discuss it with you and with your viewers. Let's start by saying that although the kids resist it, we resist it, let's make the start of school expectable, predictable, and familiar. So rather than wake up on September, whatever it is, and oh my goodness, today's the first day of school. Let's, let's get back in the rhythm of the school year, I'd say at least a good week in advance of that first day. This is all that much more important for kids who may have special needs, for kids who are adjusting from a dramatically different summer schedule, and for kids whose lives are a bit more chaotic. For example, those who go, go back and forth between two very different homes because their parents are separated, divorcing, or divorced. What I mean specifically is Billy's school year bedtime, whatever it's going to be this year, let's work our way back to it before the first night before school. So if he has to go to bed at 8 o'clock on a school night come this fall, and he's presently going to bed at 2 in the morning, maybe each night for the next week or so in advance of the school year, we'll move it back an hour. So it becomes 2, and then 1, and then midnight, so that he's well used to getting in bed on time. And here's the bad news for all of us, particularly for parents who have the luxury of some vacation themselves. Yes, I do mean let's get them up for a school year day, even though there's no school. Does that mean 6 in the morning on a beautiful August morning? Yeah, I apologize, but I do mean that. And it's important because you could also plan activities to be ready for school. That's correct. You know, and that helps them move forward. Along those lines, here, here's, here's the punchline. Here's the even worse news for the kids out there. I want them to sit at a desk and do some reading or some writing or some math before the start of the school year just to get back in the habit of which end of the pencil goes on the paper, which way does the paper orient on the desk. Can I offer one other thought along Please. those lines? Children benefit and learn better when the learning environment at home is established and specific for that purpose. So what would an ideal learning environment look like? Well, it's hard to dictate for everyone uniformly, but what I have in mind is that there ought to be one desk or one corner of the kitchen or one place where the pencils are always in this cup and the paper's always in this pile and the books are always here. So when you come home to do homework, when you get up in the morning to do the reading, this is where I go to do that. And you have a good light so that you can see everything easily. A good light and away from the main traffic areas of the house. So I don't want the big sister on the video game and the big brother who's listening to music or the pet running through or the, this shouldn't be in front of the door where the people are coming in. And although the kitchen can be handy because mom or dad is there and can supervise the homework while the child's working, I, I, I don't want the child to get up and help chop the onions in the middle of one right. plus one equals two and so ABC. So focus time. Focus space, peace, quiet, focus time. Yes. Okay. What other things? What other things? As far as tools. Let's so they're getting up in time, they're going to bed at time. Yeah. They're getting their uh, materials or anything needed before school, so they're all set. Well, I think I said a moment ago that we want to make the beginning of the school year familiar. So right. let's do that in ways above and beyond just the, the structure and the schedule of things, particularly if your student is going to a new school in the fall, uh, beginning in elementary school, middle school, high school, something of the sort. Go over and play on the playground now before the first day of school. For the younger child, let them explore the slide and the swings and, and run around, take a frisbee or a ball or have a picnic there. Invite a friend, a, another child who might be in the same class or the same grade. Make the physical environment familiar. 
Better than that even, particularly if you're familiar with the school and know who the teacher's going to be. We have to acknowledge that some schools don't tell us who our teachers are going to be until the day before classes begin. But if you know who the teacher's going to be, get in touch, call the school. Can my son or daughter come in and help in the classroom before the first day? Teachers love the assistance and the opportunity to put some stuff up on a bulletin board or move the chairs and the desks to write a word on the board in chalk. Those sorts of things make the classroom environment familiar and trusted and make that first transition back to school much easier for the child. Let me run on for just one more second, please. Getting on the bus the first day of school is, a, is the same sort of challenge and, and even bigger for kids who've never ridden the bus before. Call your town, find out where the buses are, get permission, don't do it without permission, to go visit the buses. It might sound silly to you and I, but for a five-year-old, a six-year-old who's never ridden on a big yellow machine before, it can be pretty cool. And take pictures. If the child is playing on the playground at the new school, is visiting with the teacher in the new classroom, is sitting on the bus, take out your cell phone, take some photographs, and then at home at night, review the pictures with them and review them with enthusiasm. Parents' attitudes, feelings about new events trickle down and affect the children and how they feel about it. If you as a parent are excited, enthusiastic, positive, motivated about the new school year, chances are your child will begin to feel the same. Very good. So why don't we move to parents? What are the, some of the things, if we've covered the things for the children, that you'd like to recommend for parents related to them? getting ready for the school year, because it is an adjustment for a parent, too. It is in lots of practical ways as well as emotional ways. A lot of parents out there may not admit it, but I'll bet you at least half of your audience is eager for the start of the school year, wiping their brow. There's a relief that's involved in, OK, the child's off at school. I don't have to entertain him anymore. There's a big change to the schedule involved in this process. Parents will feel a little bit of an empty nest when the child's gone, particularly parents who are home full time or who work from home, as well as that relief. I want parents to be involved in the school as well. PTA isn't there just as a bureaucratic mechanism to suit the supervisor, the, the superintendent of the school. PTA really is an opportunity to have a voice in how your children learn. Join, get involved, volunteer bake cookies, sell tickets, raise funds, participate in the curriculum development committee, participate in actually how your child is learning out there. I want parents as well to meet with teachers, to go into those open houses early in the year, not only for what the parents can learn from the teachers, but so that the child sees that it's important the parent has taken his or her valuable time and gone and met Mr. or Mrs. Smith, Mr. or Mrs. Jones, and knows that the books are in this corner near the window and the pet rabbit is in the cage over there near the door, and, and to look in the desk. And parents, take this hint. I learned it from my wife. I'll give her all the credit. Take a little trinket in and sneak it into the child's desk when you go into that open house. So the next morning when the child gets to school, the child finds the surprise. But more importantly, so the child knows mom and dad were really here, that this is an important place. It is, and it's so important because that's a parent's commitment to the child's education. That's exactly and right. And the focus is, if anything, that that's the child's job, to learn as much as they can because that's the opportunities that will open up for them, which is wonderful. So from a teacher's point of view, what can teachers do to help children and parents adjust to going back to school and to have a successful school year by working together. Let me answer that second. One other thought occurs to me from yes. the last topic about parents and yes. what can parents do. Please don't ask your kids at the end of the day, so what'd you do today? It's much too broad a question. It just it's the whole open field of I woke up by everything. Pick a specific topic about the day. How was math class? Did you get along with Billy on the playground? Was the bus ride good? Or, or structure it so that the child knows how to respond at the end of the day, over supper, at bedtime. What happened today that made you feel happy? Right. What did you do today that you're proud of? Proud means something that you did well at or worked hard at. If you structure those questions, you'll connect better with the child, and you'll learn a great more about the child's day. So your question about teachers. 
I, I so respect our teachers and what they do. They have an enormously difficult job, and they are, in my opinion, underpaid, undervalued, under-respected. They are preparing the next generation. Right. We need to support them, and we need to respect the terrifically important job that they're doing. As a professional myself, not a teacher, I couldn't do that job. I, I don't know how they do. It's really important that we all have a way of taking care of ourselves. So teachers out there, if you're listening, please make sure that somewhere in your work week you have some, some time set aside for, for self, for me. It could be a favorite TV show. It could be a walk outside with your partner. It could be yoga, meditation. Yoga, meditation. <laughs> you know something about those yeah, subjects. Absolutely. You must refuel because your job, your job, teachers, is to be a source of fuel for the children in your classroom. And you can't give to them if your tank is empty yourself. Exactly. Beyond that, I, I, I wouldn't presume to tell teachers how to teach. They I wasn't asking that question in order to do that. But one of the things I'm asking or wanting to set the tone for is to realize that parents, students, teachers together, you're a team. Absolutely. They're a team, and anything we all can do together is what helps a child thrive and have a very supportive year. But it's not just the child that survives and thrives. It's the whole community, the school community. Uh May I offer, uh, a lot of your viewers, perhaps you yourself, are familiar with the phrase, it takes a village exactly. to raise a child. No, not exactly. Okay. It takes a village to raise a child, but it takes villagers who can communicate and cooperate to raise a healthy child. Exactly. Exactly. So what would your recommendations be? You mentioned about the PTO or PTA for involvement. But what are the other ways that you would recommend to have that healthy environment and things that people can do together? Because it's all about communication. Well, it's a great deal about communication, absolutely. I, uh, I have some mixed feelings about some of our digital media these days. Mm. But the school mechanisms known by different acronyms that allow parents and teachers to stay up to date, day to day, which homework assignment is done, how's Billy doing with his conduct, what is his ongoing grade, what are his test scores, things like that, are really important tools. Teachers, I presume, go to great lengths to keep them current. Parents need to take advantage of them. It's, it's often the case in my office. Of course, I, I don't get the opportunity to meet in my office parents and children who are doing well. They come to see a psychologist because there's a problem. Mm -hmm. So it's often the case with those parents that we set up a behavior program geared towards rewarding the child on a week-to-week -week basis based on those digital feedback mechanisms from the school. So it goes like this. We motivate a child's effort in school, and often more so effort than actual grades. That is, we don't care so much does he get an A on his spelling as did he study for his spelling, and he tried really hard. So those effort grades are translated into next week's privileges. And that takes the parent out of the loop. There's no longer the power struggle. This is a power struggle between you did poorly, here's a punishment. Now it's if Billy gets the effort grade and it's on that digital mechanism on Friday, he knows here's a menu on the wall. It says an A in effort equals these privileges next week. A B in effort equals these lesser privileges next week. And then it's up to Billy. He tries, he gets privileges. He doesn't try, there's no privileges, there's no argument. Now, the day of children's lives is very busy. There are mm. lots of other activities. It seems that children go from one activity to another. To another. How, what are your thoughts about that from a parent, teacher, student perspective? Oh, my. Because that is huge. I mean, some of them are getting up very early. They're running to go to this. And then after school, they have all these other activities. And they're getting back late. And then they're trying to get their homework done. And, and sleep is compromised. And that valuable opportunity just to have downtime is right. lost. Exactly. Because if you're not involved in 16 different co-curricular, extracurricular activities, you're obviously falling behind the curve. You won't get into Harvard, MIT, or Stanford, and then life is over, right? I'm being sarcastic, of course. <laughs> it is as important for a child to have the opportunity to play and to make relationships and to explore and to relax as it is to become a black belt in karate, a on-point dancer or an Olympic gold medalist. So balance. Balance, absolutely, is, is exactly the key. And so 
how would you recommend balance based upon your years of experience of how to get that nice, healthy balance in your lifestyle when everyone is rushing mm. and doing so much from a parent's perspective as well as in school? It's an excellent question. I don't know that I have a single recipe, but here's what comes to mind. Okay. I would not program a child so that five days a week there's always something after school. I would make it a point on the calendar of saying, which day during the week are you going to have downtime? I would ask the child what he or she is invested in doing and come up with a family ethic. Each family needs its own decisions. Are we going to require that our kids do something? Is it OK if they do nothing? If we require that they sign up for something, what's the family ethic going to be about sticking to that activity versus dropping out when it first gets hard? There's pros and cons each way. What are we going to do with regard to Wednesday in November, the child is exhausted and has the sniffles? Are we going to insist that he or she goes to football practice, basketball practice, debate team practice? How are we going to help model and regulate the child's health and well-being in the face of all of these many commitments that we might make? And then how do grades factor into the larger formula? If Billy is doing four activities a week, with one day down plus weekends, and weekends get to be jam-packed as well. But as grades start to fall, where are our priorities for these things? You used the word balance before. It's exactly right. I would ask your viewers, do you want to raise a balanced child, or do you want to raise a prodigy who's had never had any downtime, but maybe is getting straight A's in math, English, and social studies? Me, personally, and professionally as well, I'd rather raise a balanced child Maybe it doesn't get into calculus before high school. We don't need to be doing 16 different languages and be a black belt in karate before we're 10. What are the tell cell signs, red flags, that parents should be aware of if their children are perhaps having some challenges and it's coming out in certain ways related to what's going on in school, i.e. bullying or trouble in school or emotionally. Maybe they're going to the bathroom a little more, having trouble eating. Well, you've begun to answer the question. It's a great question. Every parent ought to be aware. I, I want to be cautious by saying that every child is unique with his or her own patterns and habits and behavior and strengths and weaknesses compared to baseline behavior, compared to whoever your particular child is and how he or she functions day to day. A dramatic change in eating, sleeping, toileting, getting along with peers, compliance with authority, those sorts of things. And not wanting to go to school all of a sudden. School resistance as well. Any of those things can be a clue to some sort of a problem. may not be a school-related problem. It could be something as benign as the first evidence of puberty hitting. Yeah. It could be as benign as the neighbor got a new dog, and, and the dog barks, and the child is feeling a lot of anxiety. Or it could be bullying. It could be a problem with a teacher or a subject. What we want to do is be sensitive and responsive to our children's patterns and behaviors in that way. We want to ask good questions without ever being leading about it. What would be a good question to ask? Billy, I noticed that you've been pretty sleepy at the breakfast table lately. What's going on? Sally, has it been hard for you to um, get on the bus in the morning? I've noticed that you're taking a lot of time finding your shoes every day and putting your backpack together. Um, Michael, um, the teacher called and said that you haven't been uh, in the lunchroom recently, that you've been sitting in a corner by yourself. Uh, you've been complaining of a lot of sore throats lately. Should we go see the pediatrician? Uh, do you need more sleep? Are you overbooked? Uh, I mean, let's get our children's opinions about themselves. Let's teach them to look into themselves, to introspect. And then let's use our wisdom as adults who know our kids and who know about the world and evaluate what's really going on. Now, for the last, we have three minutes left. How might we summarize for that older student, let's say in high school, junior high, high school, what to be aware of, how to support them, and the types of questions to engage them in to have a successful year? Oh, you started with the hardest group. I know. Remember, we're taking the training wheels off. Right. And those teenagers, they've not only taken them off, but they've thrown them away and broken them and crushed them and probably melted them down to make a new piece of bling for themselves. They are going to resist our involvement, our, our attention, our sensitive and responsive care. 
And hard as that is, it's also necessary because that's how they take their first steps towards independence and autonomy. Another way of letting go. Another way, exactly, of letting go. But for those, for, for the teenagers, for, for adolescents locking themselves in, the, in their room and, and becoming less communicative and changing their eating, sleeping, even their toileting habits can just be puberty going on, can be adolescence, doesn't need to be a problem unless we're to begin to diagnose adolescence itself as pathology. We won't go no. there, though. <laughs> How about if we close with this idea? Okay. Structure decreases anxiety. It's true for everyone everywhere. It's why we swaddle baby. It's why we crate train dogs. It's why we need schedules and routines and limits with consequences, always emphasizing rewards for success. So whoever you are, however old your child is, whatever grade he or she is about to enter, let's create structure to make how to succeed knowable for our children. And then they'll have a much better chance of succeeding. Now, Parents, teachers, and students can learn more about what you do and the supports that you provide by going to HealthyParent.com. Is that correct? That's correct. And you are located in the greater Nashua area and provide supports to families and educators as well as children to help them in any issues related to child and family development. That's all very correct. That's yes. right. Excellent. Well. In summary, of course, we would hope that um, everyone will have a very successful school year. And most important, I think, of everything that you've said, Dr. Garber, is the importance of balance. So let's quickly, in the last 40 seconds, summarize that balance for our audience. Most important things to do. Balance in all things. Balance for yourself as a caregiver, as a teacher, and balance for your children, your students, so that we are not only investing in academics, we're investing in a whole self. Right, and a whole life, because life is a variety of parts as we develop, correct? So That's it's correct. the mind, the body, and the spirit. It's good physical health, good mental health, good psychological health, good spiritual health, and also excellent nutrition to help that body thrive. It has been a pleasure having you. Until next time, we wish you a wonderful day. Thank you. Bye.